So today is the second Sunday after Epiphany. We'll be back here in, in Denver. And uh, it is um, today also January the 19th on this uh, 2014 is a day in which there's a letter issued from France, a uh, public letter issued with about, about 30, more than 30 priests concerning our situation in the society. But the epistle for this second Sunday after Epiphany, taken from St. Paul's letter of the Romans, chapter 12. Brethren, having different gifts according to the grace that is given us, either prophecy to be used according to the rule of faith, or ministry and ministering, or he that teacheth and teaching in doctrine, he that exhorteth and exhorting, he that giveth in simplicity, with simplicity, he that ruleth with carefulness, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation, hating that which is evil, cleaving to that which is good, <clears throat> loving one another with charity of brotherhood, in honor, preventing one another, in carefulness, not slothful, in spirit, fervent, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, instant in prayer, communicating to the necessities of the saints, pursuing hospitality. Bless them that persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that rejoice, weep with them that weep, being of one mind, one towards another. Not minding high things, but consenting to the humble. And then the gospel. Take that according to St. John chapter 2. At that time there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited. And his disciples to the marriage. And the wine failing, the mother of Jesus saith to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what is it to me and to thee? My hour is not yet come. His mother said to the waiters, Whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three measures apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And Jesus said to them, Draw out now and carry to the chief steward of the feast. And they carried it. And when the chief steward had tasted the water made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the waiters knew who had drawn the water, the chief steward calleth the bridegroom and said to him, Every man at first setteth forth, first setteth forth good wine, and when men shall have drunk, Thou had that which is worse, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. The beginning of the miracles, this beginning of the miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Thus for the words of today's Holy Gospel. Amen. Amen. So today, a few considerations on this January the 19th, this 2014, in France, there is uh, uh, 45 priests that have signed on to a declaration, and as Father Giselle says, uh, we made a declaration on, uh, of, uh, of about 11 of us or 12 of us in June of 2013, on the occasion of the... Uh, the uh, 25th anniversary of the bishops, and uh, so there were maybe 15 or whatever priests, and I forget the number that signed on to it. There were 11 of us there, but then others signed on, 15, 20 priests. And one of them was Father Giselle, Father Francis was with me in in, in, in Philippines, one of the two priests, you know, that we started yelling out loud, Pentecost of 2012, in a public way. And Father Giselle sent a little note in saying, I hereby and therefore add my name to this, the uh, the umpteenth declaration, 
and I add my name to all all other declarations which may issue forth from this one. So don't bother me again. Just put my name on the next list declaration and the next 2,000 declarations <laughs> that you decide to make. <laughs> Fine, Father Zizel. <laughs> so, so many declarations have been made in the last year and a half. We made the first one in August of 2012, and then there have been declarations after declarations after declarations. And the latest one comes today, on this January the 19th, and is sent out. But this particular one is the first one to be sent in Europe, in France, and also it's, uh, it's encouraging because there are some new priests uh, joining in the battle of the resistance. And uh, the, uh, my name is not on this list, although when I was requested to, um, to, to sign this a, a week or two ago, I uh, said yes, yes, I, I, I read the, the, the French uh, the thing, uh, the, the little one-page declaration, and said yes, yes, add my name to it, but I would only add that at the end of this declaration, it says that we are going to answer the calls of the faithful, and that we priests are not only answering the calls of the faithful, but we are missionaries who are bringing the, the faith everywhere where our feet go, and every place on earth. And we are not, we are bringing the social kingship of Christ everywhere. So yes, we answer the calls of the faithful, but that is not all we're doing. We're not sitting by the phone like a fireman and waiting for a phone call, but we, uh, we do respond to phone calls, but we are out to conquer the whole world for Christ. And more or less something like that, that said, just add that to it. I would add that to it. So the declaration was published today, it was sent out today, and uh, Father Ryu is the one who took care of the sending of it out in France. Uh, he says there are many others that wanted to sign their name to this declaration, but they did not do so. The actual number we have here in this declaration is 45 priests. 45 priests, not including myself, it would be 46. And, um, and, then, and, so, and then some others who uh, would have signed also. Most of these priests are society priests, some friends of the society. Ten priests from uh, Avrier in France. So there's, there's ten priests in France. Uh, in just the one place of Avrier, Father Pierre Marie, the superior sign in the name of all those priests. And so it's good that they put their signature finally in a public way, uh, and that's very good. I visited them about three times in the last year, and, uh, and so, uh, and they've always received me well in this time of, of, uh, of uh, difficulty, and, and uh, so in, in which, you know, this is, uh, Father Pfeiffer and the priests of resistance are not welcome in, in, in any society circles or in the Friends of the Society. <laughs> but in any case, so Father Pierre-Marie and the priest of Avrier always received me. I stayed at the house. We met with the priests. And the last time was only a couple of months ago that I stopped by. And so now they're making a public statement, so that's very good. I'll read here the statement, and then just a few considerations, since today is the actual day of this first statement coming from Europe uh, on the crisis in the society. Address to the Faithful. It was a public address to the faithful, just published a few hours ago in France, uh, and uh, so we read it here. Faithful to the legacy of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, in particular his memorable declaration of the 21st of November 1974, we adhere with all our heart, all our soul, to Catholic Rome, guardian of the Catholic faith, and the traditions necessary to maintain this faith, to eternal Rome, mistress of wisdom and truth. In the example of this great prelate, fearless defender of the church and the apostolic see. We refuse by cons and have always refused to follow the neo-modernist and neo-Protestant Rome, which was clearly manifested in the Second Vatican Council and after the Council and all the reforms and policies that are derived from it. Since 2000, since the year 2000, and especially since 2012, the authorities of the priestly paternity of St. Pius X in the opposite direction are, are, going, are in the opposite direction approaching modernist Rome. The doctrinal statement of April 15, 2012, followed by the expulsion of a bishop and many priests, and confirmed by the sentence of the book of our relationship with the Archbishop Lefebvre in Rome. This is a book published by Father Piver and which uh, was printed not by the Society publication, but by another publication. It's about a 300-page book, uh, the Society, Archbishop Lefebvre and his rapport with Rome. And all it is is a compilation of Archbishop Lefebvre's writings and uh, talks with regard to Rome. And it is clear from that book 
that it's only a compilation of Archbishop Lefebvre's writings and rapport with Rome, that it is very clear that Archbishop Lefebvre's stance was the same from the beginning and the middle and all the way to the end, which is nothing, to, no deal, no making of any, any kind of agreement with modernist Rome until Rome converts. Rome has to convert back to the Catholic faith. So the very familiar words we've heard from Archbishop Lefebvre is simply just repeated again and again and again in many, many texts. And our, our Bishop Fillet forbade this book to be sold. He, could, he told Father de Cacre, the Superior of France, this book cannot be sold in our bookstores. Father de Cacre refused to obey Bishop Fillet. Some of the priests, the liberal priests in France, banned the book from the bookstores. The conservative priests in France put the books in the bookstores. And Bishop uh, Father de Cacre refused to remove them from the bookstores. And so half the priories have the books in the bookstore, half the priories don't have the books in the bookstore, and then this is the way it's been for at least six or eight months. But then right before Christmas, Bishop Fillet decided to have a major lowering of the boom and reissue the command that this book must be condemned because it does not show, according to Bishop Fillet, the full mind of Archbishop de Lefebvre. It's only 400 pages of his quotes, and therefore it doesn't show his full mind. And so that there's a part that's missing, the part that Bishop Fillet is not able to bring up. And so, therefore, its book was condemned. And so the doctrinal statement of April, going back to this declaration, the doctrinal statement of April the 15th, 2012, followed by the expulsion of, of, a, of one bishop and many priests, in, uh, and uh, confirmed by the sentence of the book of our relationship with the, with the Archbishop Lefebvre of Rome, all this shows pertinacity in this way that leads to death. No authority, even higher in the hierarchy, no matter how high in the hierarchy, can force us to abandon or diminish our Catholic faith, clearly expressed and professed by the magisterium of the Church for 20 centuries. Under the protection of Our Lady, Guardian of the Faith, we intend to continue the survival operation begun by Archbishop Lefebvre. Accordingly, in the tragic circumstances in which we find ourselves, we offer our priesthood, we make our priesthood available to all those who want to remain faithful to the fight of the faith. That is why, right now, we are committed to respond to the requests that, uh, which we will receive to support your families in their educational tasks, provide priestly formation for young men that want it, and ensure the Mass, the sacraments, and the doctrinal formation wherever it is necessary. As for you, the faithful, we urge you to be zealous apostles to the reign of Christ the King and Mary the Queen. Long live Christ the King. Our Lady, Guardian of the Faith, protect us. St. Pius X, pray for us on the uh, 7th of January, 2014. Release this January the 19th. And then the, uh, we are available to our fellow priests. Some are not able or not desired initially at least to join in our approach, so you don't hesitate to contact us, blah, blah, blah. And then we have here the names of the signatories, uh, Father de Marod, Father Colaire, Father Vignoulou, etc. And it's uh, 45 priests that signed, of which about 20, 20 to 23 of them are new, that are not already part of the resistance. So about 25 of them, 20, about, about half of them were already part of the resistance, and the other half are new names added to the list, and uh, so that uh, many of the uh, the French priests, some in Kenya, uh, in France, uh, in, the, in, 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 in Switzerland, uh, as well as some German priests and so on, added their names to the list. And uh, so that, um, uh, so this was a letter that was sent. At the, I, I signed it, I, I put my name to it, but I guess somewhere in the process it didn't get, didn't get communicated to the, the powers that be that, uh, put their name on this little declaration. And, uh, but in any case, the note here, we'll just consider today just a little theological consideration of a couple of the consequences that it says here that we will respond to the call of the faithful. We are in a state of necessity in the church. And so, some things to note there are a couple of priests in that list who, uh, as far as I know, they are state of the contest. There's at least there's two priests, I believe, in this list that are state of the contest. I myself would not, uh, if I was in charge of the list, would not allow their names to be there, even though, uh, you know, I've, I've uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, met with one of those, I've talked with one of those priests, the other one I have not spoken with. 
Uh, but nonetheless, there's two priests who are setting the contest in the list, so we must make a note concerning that. And then also, at the end of the little document, which uh, I told the priest, the priest that sent me the letter to sign, his name is not on that list. So uh, maybe that's the reason. He sent me the, the letter, and he sent me the request to sign. I sent back saying, yes, I signed with a little note that I made before. And, uh, but then neither his name nor my name are on that list. So the French priest that contacted me also isn't on the list, so I don't know. Maybe he changed his mind, maybe in the process, that his signature, my signature, was buried with his. But in any case, I'm not worried about signatures. Uh, this is not a time of signatures, although it's important that we put them. It is not a time of words, though it's important that we say them. It is a time of action. It is a time in which we are needed in order to, pr pr to spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to, to spread the kingdom of Christ and fight against the errors of liberalism and modernism, which are not only found in the modern church, but are also to be found in our society, St. Pius X, and in the new direction of Catholic tradition. So it's good to see another 45 priests sign their names. For those that have ears to hear and eyes to see, it would be a sign that there's something seriously wrong. With these names, adding 23 names with the already 50 priests, more or less, of the resistance, we're up to 75 priests, more or less, who have given their names to a fight against the new modern direction of Bishop Fillet. And when you consider that there's only 560 priests in the society, and of course some of those 75 priests are not members of the society, about half of them are not members, a little less than half are not members, so about 40 priests of the Society of St. Pius X, uh, and so it's a very large percentage, the biggest ever. And so these are signs to anybody, any faithful, that they should at least investigate the situation. Investigate whether or not there has been a change of doctrine in the society. And of course there has. There has been uh, the April, as they say in this little short note, the April 15th Declaration, which has heretical statements. Bishop Fillet continues to back it up. He continues to stand behind it, saying the new mass is legitimately promulgated, saying the Vatican II can be understood, religious liberty and humanism contained in Vatican II can be understood in the light of tradition, which is false, and that Vatican II, of course, enlightens and deepens all the teachings of the past. So these are clear lies, contrary to the truth, and they lead to the damnation of souls. Therefore, any priest who is a Catholic priest must stand up against this grave, these grave errors. And so the uh, Bishop Fillet refuses to retract them. However, one of the disputes that's going on right now, apparently in some circles within our little resistance movement, is what are we going to do about jurisdiction, the supply of jurisdiction? And supply of jurisdiction, of course, is the same for all of the priests of the tradition, whether it be a member of St. Isidore's, lives by sort of supply of jurisdiction. St. Isidore's is an illegal church, it is not considered a church. It is not, it is not accept, ex, ex, uh, accepted by the diocese. It is rejected by the diocese. Any Catholic that goes to Mass there is considered outside the realm of the authority of the diocese and therefore outside of the realm of the authority of Rome. And so why can we go there? Because it is teaching, the, the St. Isidore's is supposed to be teaching the Catholic faith, celebrating the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass according to the true Mass. And though the priests are considered vagos priests, one little detail that we must note. Every priest of tradition is considered a vagus, which means a vagrant, a wandering priest. Including Bishop Fillet, he is considered a vagus. And every priest within the Society of St. Pius X is considered a vagus. And every priest of Catholic tradition is considered a vagus because they are, they are not under the authority of Rome, canonically, and they're not under the authority of the local bishop, canonically. Therefore, they don't have, according to a normal times, they would not have the right to uh, hear confessions, to do marriages, or to say public masses for the faithful that will fulfill their Sunday obligations. And why do we do this? Because there is a crisis in the church and there is a law called Epikaia. The law of Epikaia is a reminder that the purpose of all of the laws of the church is the salvation of souls, and that whenever any practical application of any law goes against the purpose of the law, it must be broken. And for the sake of the law. So if your grandpa is dying and is a 50 mile an hour speed zone 
and you drive 12 miles an hour, three hours to drive to the airport, to the, to the uh, I'm always thinking of airports, driving to the hospital, and then your, your father, your grandfather dies because you didn't drive there fast enough, you can be guilty, of, you can be punished by law for obeying the law. You can be punished by the law because the purpose of the law was safety. And when you exercise the letter of the law in order to endanger someone's life, you are going against the law. And so that's a law of Epikiah. You cannot follow the letter of the law in order to break the spirit or purpose of the law. If you do this, you are guilty. And the law demands that you break the law in some instances. So if you go to a man, if a man, if a man is burning in his house, house is on fire, the man is unconscious, laying on the floor, but you didn't ask permission to walk into his house. If you went into his house, it's called breaking and entering. So you stand outside and take a picture, like as your reporter, of the man burning to death. The law of Epikiah demands that you break and enter, that you go into the house, that you save the man. The law of Epikiah is quite simple. It applies to all laws. Not only the law of the church, but civil law and anything that can be called law. Whenever the, whenever the purpose of law of the church is the salvation of souls, if any law goes against that purpose, it must be violated by the letter in order that the spirit may be maintained and the purpose be maintained. Not it can be, but it in most cases must be. This is the law of Epikiah. Since in every diocese throughout the world, the Catholic bishops are celebrating the new Mass, which is an abomination before God, even if they hold their fingers together, and they use beautiful vestments, and they use nice chalices, the Mass, the new Mass, is an abomination before God. The new Mass is against God. The new Mass is a Protestant Mass. It is not a Catholic Mass. Therefore, we must fight against it as Catholics. And... The new teaching of Vatican II is not Catholic. It is contrary to the teaching of our fathers. And therefore, it must be disobeyed. And hence, if the bishop who says the new Mass and the bishop that supports the new teachings says that I cannot teach the truth in his diocese, he will be judged by God for his guilt in that matter. But as for myself, I am obliged to obey God rather than men. This is the simple law of Epikiah. It applies to every priest who is called a vagus. This law of Epikiah is not because the faithful call for the priest. One of the errors or mistakes that has entered into Catholic tradition in the last few years is that the priest says, I get my jurisdiction from the faithful. It's just like the, the, the American heretical teaching that the, the, the king or the president gets his authority from the people. The people cannot give the authority to the king. They cannot give the authority to the president. They can, they can elect a president. They can elect a king. In the past, kings were elected. Some kings were elected. They can elect a king. They can elect a president. They can elect a mayor. But all they can do, they can elect bishops and they can elect a pope. The pope is elected. In olden times, bishops were elected. And, uh, and the kings were sometimes elected, and presidents are always elected. These elections do not give authority to the one who is elected. The authority is given by God. That is why, once they receive the authority, the, the people can't say, Oh, I wish I didn't elect you. I changed my mind. <laughs> Doesn't work. If the, if the authority came from the people, the people could take the authority back if they didn't like the leader. The authority does not come from the people. The authority comes from God. And so, therefore, we priests of Catholic tradition and the bishops of Catholic tradition, we do not receive our jurisdiction from the faithful. We do respond to the call of the faithful, and our, the church supplies a jurisdiction because of the needs of the faithful. But the church doesn't supply the jurisdiction because of the call of the faithful, but because of the needs of the faithful. That's an essential difference. Supposing, for instance, went to anoint a man earlier this morning. So supposing, for instance, that, 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 the, that a man is, 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 is dying and he doesn't want father to come. The priest still has the right to come because he needs the priest whether he likes it or not. Whether he knows it or not. The priest has the right to come and to tell him, you need to convert. 
This has happened many times in the life of priests and the lives of the saints. The priest has the right to go to the faithful because the faithful have the need. Not just because the faithful call, but because the faithful have the need. Now, in throughout the entire world today, the faithful need the Catholic truth. They need the Catholic doctrine. They need the Catholic mass. They need the, they need the sacraments of the church. But most importantly, they need the clear enunciation of the Catholic faith. That's what they need. And if it is not being given to them in a correct manner by the priests that have been set over their charge, another priest who has the true faith has the right to invade the other priest's territory. This